Okay, so good morning, quantum enthusiasts. This is lecture two, and we're going to talk about qubits and some other stuff. So uh, you might remember this definition of quantum computation or quantum computer that I put up last time. You know, I said a quantum computer is just any programmable device that um, natively supports the data type qubit. So we're going to be talking about this data type qubit today. Now, before we get there, I actually want to show you uh, a, a modification of this definition that will help um, motivate what we're going to do. So I can just cross out some bits, and I think this is a, becomes a, still a reasonable definition. Uh, bits as in pieces. It still becomes like a reasonable uh, definition if we just say like a computer is any programmable device that natively supports the data type uh, bit. Um, because that's what the regular computers that we all have do, right? They manipulate uh, bits. And, uh, you know, as you know, your computer stores like many things, like strings and numbers, and it's computing on images and videos. But as you, you know, learned in your cradle, um, you know, all kinds of data can be just represented with zeros and ones. And that's how computers work. Jump around, do some operations on them until you have the desired output. Maybe also expressed in, in bits. And... You know, now I want to talk about one of the, like, the, the cool aspects of quantum computing. It's really thinking about the connection between like, logic and math and like, the abstract world and like, the physical you know, universe that we inhabit. In that, um, if you think about you know, when you write a computer program, OK, it's maybe it's a high-level language, but ultimately it's like manipulating bits. But what are, what are these instructions really doing? They're kind of instructions for physically manipulating physical objects, actually. Because at the end of the day, I mean, your computer is composed of physical objects, and these bits are stored via physical objects. So these are also thinkable as um, you know, instructions for you know, physical manipulation of objects that represent the bits. OK, so we won't you know, really get into it too much, but um, you know, when you allocate like a megabyte of memory in your computer code, like it, you know, it does it somewhere, I don't know, in your RAM or something. But what is your RAM? It's a bunch of tiny little physical capacitors. I think it's capacitors. That's some kind of electronic thing. And there's like millions or billions or trillions of them. And like, you know, you're saying like, okay, I'm going to like ma manipulate this capacitor. It's going to stand for my bit, like zero or one. And like if it's charged, that stands for one. And if it's uncharged, that stands for zero. And my future computer program is going to like manipulate these charges physically to represent these logical zeros and ones that I'm manipulating. OK, I don't know, maybe in the olden days they did it with uh, like vacuum tubes or whatever or whatnot. Um, and indeed, like any physical object that has two, you know, kind of, well, let's say that has a property that can take on different states can be used for computing. Just like you have an object, it's got a property that can be take on different states. You could use this for computing. So let me give some you know, examples. Maybe these are not too practical, but um, well, maybe at ancient times in history, uh, things like these were used for computing. So uh, well, you know, probably his favorite example is like a coin. It's very popular. And you imagine this coin is like lying on the table, and its property is like, you know, which side is up. And that can be either heads or tails. And then you're like, cool, I have like a physical object that has two different basic states, and I can, you know, use it to store a logical concept of bit. And you can just be like, all right, heads equals zero, tails equals one, and great. Now I have a bit. If I have two coins on the table, great, now I have two bits. Um, I guess in like the, the 30s and stuff, like they would use like physical switches, like a light switch, an object which does not exist in this room, as we found out. Uh, so like a switch, and you know, if it can be like up or down, it has like some position. It can be like up or down. Okay, and great, you can use that to like store a bit. Okay, or if you're really computing, like you can have like an abacus bead. And I guess the way this works is like. Whether or not it's like touching the bar or touching the beam has, I don't know how to use an abacus, but I quickly watched a video about it. Uh, something like yes or no, that can store a bit. Um, now, in our actual computers, like, okay, we're advanced past these things, but I guess if you still have like a, whatever the precursor to a solid state hard drive was, which wasn't that long ago, I guess we'd use like tiny magnetized regions to store bits. So it's like you have like a teeny tiny like bar magnet. 
Um, maybe you like, and you place it like horizontally. And then, um, you know, whether like the north is on the left or right side is storing your bit. So it's like left or right. Okay, now these are all examples, uh, you know, picked examples of objects that have a property that have like two basic states. And um, you can also have things that have more than two basic states. So kind of similar to the coin, if you have like a regular D6, a die, you know, it's like the face that's showing up, and this can have, be like one, two, three, four, five, or six. Okay. Um, so the first four examples I just made up here all have the property that they have like two distinguishable basic states. And whenever you have this, you can be, you just call one of them zero and call one of them one and be like, great, now I've, you can use this to represent a logical um, bit. Um, you know, if you have this object, which conveniently has like six basic states, you can be like, oh, I could use this to like, you know, encode like an integer variable that has to be bounded between one and six. Okay, so there's something really special about two. Um, you know, except that like, our long experience with computing just has taught us it's like more convenient just to use bits, do everything in base two. It's just uh, it's just more convenient than anything else. So I mean, as you again probably know, the way you typically, if you needed to store a variable between one and six on your computer, what you'd probably do is like allocate like three bits for it. And now you can store a number between I don't know zero and seven. You're like, okay, there's a little bit of waste. That's fine. So you know, practically speaking, you'd probably you know get three little, you know, magnetized regions on your disk drive, or like three capacitors, and be like, these are going to store my number between one and six, you know, in binary. Okay, so this would just be like a system where like zero, zero, one counts for one, and zero, one, zero counts for two, and zero, one, one is... Okay, it's easier for me to write them like this first. Okay, three, four, five, six. Okay, and this is like a simple way of, you know, how you might encode like a more complex object, like a number between one and six using uh, bits. But, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to like stick with um, bits, but I just want to say there's nothing like overly special about two. It's just convenient. And while I'm on this subject, I mean, uh, I want to make like a, a little bit of a subtle point here. Um, let's say you do this, and you're like, oh, I'm going to store a number between one and six on my old-fashioned hard drive, so I've allocated like three little magnets to store the bits. You can think of this as like, um, you know, three magnets, each with two basic states, like each one, you know, can have the state left or right, and that ultimately corresponds to your number. Or you can, in your mind, say like, you know, I'm going to consider this triple magnet to just be its own, like, super object. Um, so I'll just like in my mind think like, oh, I have like one triple magnet, or like whenever I have three magnets next to each other, I just call that like one object. Uh, and it has like eight basic states. You know, and this eight is of course two to the three basic states. Okay, so in this way, if you're willing to like just take like you know a bunch of actual objects that have two basic states and like glom them together, and I think of this as like a new object, you know, you can make objects that have like a large number of uh, basic states. Okay, and this is like the kind of thing you would typically do because like I don't know if you're like trying to store a number between one and a million, it's very tedious to find like a physical object with a million different basic states, or like you know like a die with a million faces. That's annoying. Uh, so you just get like 20 coins. That's easy. Go to the store. Or like 20 bar magnets. And now you have two to the 20 basic possibilities, which is like a little bit bigger than a million. So now you can store numbers between one and a million. Okay, so that's a short refresh on bits. I assume you're all familiar with that. Um, right, but now let's talk about uh, qubits. I can write it here. Qubits. So again, this is a, a logical data type, and you know we're going to get into it today. But like the nature of qubits is that they can have two um, basic states, maybe called zero and one, with these brackets. But they can also have like combinations or like superpositions thereof. Combinations or superpositions. 
thereof. Okay, and we're going to explain what this means uh, today. So, okay. Now, if you think back to this uh, definition, um, you know, you might ask yourself, okay, this is going to be some mathematical concept that involves like combinations of two possibilities. Like, what physical object can embody that? You know, what physical object can uh, model a qubit? Um, and uh, something kind of amazing is true. Um, it's uh, something, you know, that we've learned from the laws of uh, physics. Um, literally any physical object um, with two basic states can model a qubit. Let me throw in, in principle, like theoretically, according to the laws of physics, model a qubit. Okay? So, in particular, everything you see on this table, well, ignore the die for now, uh, that has two possibilities. It could also represent a qubit. What I'm saying is, it's theoretically possible for an actual coin, like lying on the table, to not be heads up or tails up, but to be in some kind of superposition combination of heads up and tails up at the same time. This is like um, theoretically possible. Uh, so that might seem uh, disturbing. And um, before, like you're obviously you're like, what, what does that look like? Uh, I'll come back to that. I'll stall for a little bit uh, or intrigue you by that and um, talk a little bit about uh, you know, this law of nature that says this is possible uh, first. Okay, so this is very important, uh, I guess, law of quantum mechanics. I should put it in a box or something. This is something, you know, that, um, I don't know, physicists figured out in the 19, I don't know, 10s or something. So... 110 years of, of physics have verified this fact. Um, okay, so if any, an object can be in two basic states, and we're, if an object can be in two basic states, which we'll call uh, zero and one, let me try to use some colors at least briefly here. Okay, and it could be like, these are abstractions. So, I mean, it could be like up and down, and like up is zero and one is down, or it could be, I don't know, heads or tails. Okay, then uh, it can also be in any superposition state. And the superposition state looks like the following. Um, X amplitude on uh, zero. Y amplitude on one. Okay. Let me color code these again just because, um, see, zero is both like the name of a basic state and it's also like a regular old number. And like it, that can be kind of confusing. Uh, so we have to deal a little bit with this confusion. So at least for a while, I'll try to use this colors to slightly assist us. Um, where these x and y's are uh, real numbers. And not just any old real numbers. They have to satisfy one property. Uh, they have to satisfy that x squared plus y squared equals 1. Okay, so this is uh, a law of nature, as it turns out. And there's a little, uh, there's a little generalization of this, which I won't write for a time, but I'll just uh, say it in, in words. Um, this is the law if you have like an object with like two basic states, but if you have an object with like six basic states, like this die, there's an analogous law where if this die can be in, you know, either one, two, three, four, five, or six, um, 
which maybe you'd write with like these like special brackets to remind yourself that it's a basic state. Then it can be also in a superposition where you have like some real amplitude for each of the six possibilities, maybe A, B, C, D, E, F. And the rule is that the sum of the squares of the amplitudes has to be one. So A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared plus E squared plus F squared has to be one. So this is the special case where uh, we just have two basic states, zero and one. OK, so you know, we also, it's not really clear what this means, but like, this is like a mathematical uh, law that you can just take for granted. Um, well, eventually we'll talk about like, what it means and how it manifests itself. Well, let me give you an example. Um, there's basically uh, two nice numbers whose squares add up to 1. It's like 0.8 and 0.6. So I'll be constantly using those two numbers because they're like the least annoying numbers that satisfy x squared plus y squared equals 1. So that's an example. Um, a coin lying on a table, in principle, again, in principle, be in the state, or let me say superposition state, Um, like 0 0.8 amplitude on heads and negative 0 0.6 amplitude on tails. So yeah, these are not just real numbers. They're, they can even be negative. I mean, they can be negative numbers. And that's okay. That's valid because it satisfies, you know, x, here's x is 0 0.8 and y is negative 0 0.6. And that's like uh, valid because... Um, you know, 0 0.8 squared plus negative 0 0.6 squared, that's 0.64 plus 0.36, is indeed 1. Okay. So, cool. Um, okay, one more thing. Um, you might, if you've still, like, seen quanta before, or, like, you heard people talk about quantum, you might also know that, like, aren't there also, like, complex numbers? I mean, if you didn't know this, well, I'll tell you now. Um, like, can't these amplitudes also be complex numbers? And they can even be complex numbers. That's actually maybe, like, the true law, that these can be, like, complex numbers with, like, a property like this. You know, meaning there's, like, some i's in there. So it's even possible to have, like, 0 0.8 times i amplitude on heads. But, um... Here's the thing. Uh, it turns out that like, if you just want to like, know everything there is to know about quantum computing and do quantum computing, you never need to use complex numbers. You never, um, it's never necessary to like, get your qubits into states that involve complex numbers. It's always sufficient to only ever use real numbers. And uh, so I decided in this course, that's what we're going to do. Like, let's not like, additionally confuse ourselves with, like, there's also complex numbers. Let's just stick to the reals. We'll keep it um, real. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.